We don't know what we don't know, so to know we are smart, we need to make a comparison between ourselves and others. But that means we need a perception of how smart we are in the first place, to compare that with others. But we need the comparison for how smart we are, so it's like a chicken and the egg scenario, which one comes first? The research into hypo and hypercognition looks to find an answer for self-assessing our own intelligence. Hypocognition is when you don't have a word or mental representation for an object, category or idea, whereas hypercognition is when you apply things you are familiar with to situations where it doesn't quite fit. So if you didn't know what hypocognition meant, you were hypocognitive before you heard me explain it. If you thought hypocognition was not thinking enough about something, because hypo is under or reduced and cognition meaning thinking, then you were hypercognitive of hypocognition. The line between knowing something or being ignorant of something often arrives much sooner than people think, as we don't know what we don't know. We are all meta-ignorant or ignorant of our own ignorance, potentially justifying ourselves by saying ignorance is bliss, but there are two sides to that saying. Our ignorance and overconfidence can be beneficial when doing something, but when we are planning something out, it really helps to know things beforehand. There are loads of examples of ignorance in everyday life. A study with 2,500 Americans found only half could name the branches of the federal government. Only 54% knew that declaring war rests with Congress, not the president, and only 57% could properly identify the role played by the electoral college. I'm not from America and I don't pay too much attention to the politics, so I assume what the research is saying is right, but that is my own ignorance of America and policy and politics. Then a different study with 1,500 US adults found only 53% knew electrons are smaller than atoms, and only 51% could identify that the Earth revolves around the Sun, not the other way around. <laughs> and a massive survey found 90 million of around 300 million people in the US have difficulty understanding health information which is leading to medication misuse. Moving out of America, a study asked financial questions to people with financial literacy, so you would expect them to know the answer to financial questions, but they found only 56% getting both financial questions asked correct. This ignorance links to the concept of unknown unknowns, which has a long history in design and engineering, has roots in decision theory, and in architecture. But evidence in psychology is showing that people seem to know very little about the gaps in their own knowledge. One example found readers making claims that they had deep understanding of a passage they had read, but failed to recognise direct contradictions inside the text. Other examples were claims for understanding of how helicopters, flush toilets and cylinder locks work, or political candidates' positions of social issues. All of the studies found when people were asked to explain how things work or the positions candidates held, they almost all backed down from the explanation and didn't have an answer. When we don't know, we often use the reach around technique, which is when general knowledge appears to be relevant, but isn't. People typically more narcissistic can even claim to know things that don't exist. This has been referred to as overclaiming, described as a form of self-enhancement or protecting one's ego, which is separate from actual intelligence. They can't use domain-specific knowledge because it doesn't exist, so they use read-around knowledge instead, which is more general knowledge that seems like it might be relevant. This is from the hypercognitive research. If there isn't general reach-around knowledge, people tend to rightly say they don't know due to no intellectual scaffolding to fall back on. If a don't know response isn't offered, there is a 36% rise in opinions about fictitious topics being shared, so adding that option can reduce the likelihood of overclaiming. Less educated individuals, paradoxically, tend to claim greater ignorance on real topics, but offer more opinions on non-existent ones, suggesting they have a more difficult time separating knowledge from ignorance and overclaim more often. Potentially, those who are less literate or numerate may suffer not only from the lack of skill, but also from not knowing that there is information they need to seek out. Literacy has been shown to influence how people perform in a wide variety of settings, from health behaviour to job settings to financial decision making. Numeracy, or the ability to reason with numbers and mathematical concepts, has been similarly linked to health and economic outcomes. So our ignorance, lack of knowledge or information, and meta-ignorance, or ignorance of ignorance, comes from a lack of expertise and knowledge often hiding in unknown unknowns, or disguised by reach-around knowledge. When we are asked a question, we are typically more confident when we have a quick response using our intuition, or when we are familiar with the overall area. 
Judgment speeds are normally accurate, but it can be misleading, resulting in inflated self-estimates and perceived understanding, which we see in the cognitive reflection test. When asked the question, if a bat and a ball cost £1.10p in total, the bat costs £1 more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? 68% of people give the wrong answer of 10p. If the ball was 10p and the bat was £1, the difference is 90p, not £1. So the ball costs 5p and the bat costs £1.5p. We also perceive good fluency as an indicator for high intuition, but that can also inflate our self-estimates beyond actual understanding something I mentioned in my reaction to Veritasium's video on experts. We can get an answer quickly with confidence, but be completely wrong. And sometimes we have a method that we followed to get to our answer, but again, that doesn't mean it was the right method. That is an example of a rational error, which is when people follow some overall rule or algorithm to compute their response across similar problems. The more they use the rule, the more confident they get in the rule, and the more a different rule reduces their own confidence. An example study found participants who were mostly right and mostly wrong tended to be the most systematic in their approach to the task, using either the right algorithm or wrong algorithm. Those that were wrong had rational errors in their logic, which educators should trace to prior knowledge or current examples to find where the misconception is or was. These rational errors can be why we are so sure of an answer or multiple answers because we have used a rule, an algorithm or a set of principles to follow that may have worked before or in an example we have just seen. But there is an unknown unknown in the rule we followed. Metacognitive achievement is the metacognitive task of judging our success of the performance of a task. Research has found that those with a higher performance level are more accurate than those with a poor performance level, potentially due to the skills needed to judge the accuracy of a response, being the same as those needed to create an accurate response. This means top performers can readjust their performance misjudgments, whereas bottom performers are unable to recognize what they are missing due to unknown unknowns. The difference in metacognitive achievement has been discovered in a wide range of tasks such as students taking an exam, readers indicating how well they comprehend a narrative passage, clinicians, bridge players, pharmacy school graduates, physics experts, educational interpreters, sports coaches, drivers, tennis players, the list goes on. There have been some null results but in general we struggle to recognize our own ignorance. There seems to be a motivational factor where we try and defend our ego but when we are problem solving alone it is often far too intrinsically difficult, again leading to inflated self views. Judging our ability on performance from external sources like feedback could also lead to an inaccurate perception of ability or inflated views, suggesting those that use ambiguous measures are more likely to be affected. So using measures that don't accurately reflect performance competence, like saying a person with 1 million views on a video knows more than a professor with a couple hundred views because the feedback views was higher for the creator but the views were not an accurate performance metric. This performance misjudgment between perceived competence and actual competence is what Dunning and Kruger found in their hypo and hypercognitive research. The Dunning-Kruger effect is where poor performers overestimate their abilities, which could be due to inflated ego, perceived understanding from a professional role, or from overinflated views where they believe they are above average. The lack of knowledge leads to mistakes, but also prevents them from recognizing when they are making mistakes, meaning it is harder to explain to them why they are potentially wrong. The false consensus effect is where high performers underestimate their abilities due to overestimating others because correct answers come relatively easy to them, they mistakenly believe that other people must be coming to the same correct choices. This can be helped by encouraging more metacognitive achievement activities, like tasks that bring awareness to the other people's competence. Our overly inflated views of competence and performance has plenty of examples from logical reasoning and grammar, social abilities, firearm use, laboratory procedures, and chess tournament entries. We think on average that we are outperforming our peers when it is statistically impossible for that many of us to have above average performances. One study finding People at the bottom overestimate their raw performance by nearly 30%, but there have been some critiques of the Dunning-Kruger and false consensus effects. Statistical regression to the mean suggests that if we select the poorest performer along one variable, the second variable will not be so extreme. 
In this case, actual results on the x-axis and result possibilities on the y-axis. If the best performer is selected, the second variable will be lower relative to the top variable. In other words, people with lower actual performance have more room to overestimate, so the mean is likely to be higher. Combine that with the people's tendencies to rate themselves above average, and this could explain the Dunning-Kruger and false consensus effect. The noise plus bias agrees with this statistical regression argument, suggesting perception of task difficulty could also play a role. But a paper I have reviewed on the YouTube channel before by Erlinger and colleagues from 2008 argues against these claims. For the task difficulty argument, easily perceived tasks show poor performers have inaccurate assessments, but tasks perceived as difficult show high performers being inaccurate with their assessments, as they all reduce their perception of results, effectively flipping the effect to the top performers. So task difficulty doesn't seem to account for the effects, merely impacts the direction of the effects. When accounting for regression, the results remain very similar. There are small differences, but the effects are still present. There was an argument for accountability of the answers given, suggesting poor performers know the answers, they just don't want to say them. But again, the previously mentioned study argued against this and actually found the effect might be increased with accountability. Poor performers further inflated their views away from the actual scores, which is a very similar story to the motivation argument. Poor performers not being motivated to give a true answer, but the Erlinger paper again shows that motivation could actually inflate self-views rather than decrease them. So in my eyes, the effects still stand strong. Now, our perceived scores are strongly correlated with preconceived notions and preconceived percentile scores correlating with perceived actual performance, which impacts future choices and interests. But as we have discussed, performance misjudgments can create incorrect self-assessments. So those choices could be made on faulty logic, read around knowledge or rational errors. A preconceived notion or previous self-view is a belief or opinion usually formed with prior knowledge about a concept, topic or idea. Despite a lifetime of interactions with objects, people possess misconceptions about how everyday objects move, also showing incorrect beliefs about emotions and how welfare systems work. A different example is when interns assessed their ability to teach a topic, they rated themselves highly, but a supervisor suggested they still required guidance. Sound familiar? Yogurt labelled as full fat rather than low fat is rated as tastier. A bottle of wine is rated better when you're told it is more expensive, and people literally see the skin colour in a face as darker when it is labelled as African American rather than European American. We make decisions and choices all the time from misconceptions, but the misconceptions or misperceptions of our own competence can impact the people around us. A reliance on preconceived notions may prevent people from realising competencies that they have, or at least inhibiting them from recognising that they are doing just as well as their peers. Women's preconceived notions impact professional choices, especially in science and engineering. This is not due to an ability difference, but a difference in the way women think of their aptitude compared to men. A study found women perceiving their answers to be 13% more wrong than the men, and that their performance was 17 percentile points lower than the men, which led to 70% of males expressing interest in a science-related job compared to 49% of females. The actual scores were extremely close, but because of preconceived notions, there wasn't as much interest. A different study on emotional intelligence told business school students their score relative to national norms and asked if they wanted a book on the emotionally intelligent manager for a 50% discount. Those scoring in the top quartile, 64% wanted the book. However, those in the bottom quartile, only 19%. Across several studies, people's top-down self-views influence their experiences with a task, in turn influencing their impression of objective performance. But by labelling individuals' abilities before a test, it can impact their performance. So in theory, by labelling people, or by self-labelling, you can help and or hurt other people or yourself before you have an objective metric to use. The self-fulfilling prophecy comes to mind, but that is a different conversation. The counterfactual regression is a statistical tool essentially creating a world where everyone knows the scores of others for social comparison. Performance predictions are more accurate, but unfortunately, we don't have direct access to, to right or wrong conclusions or an answer sheet of judgment accuracy. But we do have indirect cues from our environment, other people. However, 
Many people, especially poor performers, often lack the intellectual scaffolding to believe reasonable answers because they don't know what they don't know. Informing them of flaws can lower their self-rating, as mentioned before with read-around knowledge, and challenging misconceptions for conceptual change can take a lot of time, as I expressed in the Multimedia Education Thesis Review. Once poor performers recognise their incompetence, they show ample ability and willingness to recognise their past errors. It is getting them there that is the difficult bit. Educating poor performers is hard as they push back, rebel against the advice, and argue points of view that contradict their own because of shallow understanding, or they don't trust <laughs> experts. Similarly, confronting people with evidence does not necessarily lead to them reconsidering their misbeliefs. Some counter-arguing the evidence, refusing to believe in the evidence's validity, bolstering the attitudes they already had, or simply refusing to engage in any discussion on the matter. Those people don't necessarily learn to anticipate their incompetence even after repeated feedback. Although high-performing students become more accurate in predicting their performance in class from test to test, low-performing students don't. They remain stubbornly optimistic about how well they will do in the next test. We all have unknown unknowns, and we will never be able to know them all, but we can engage in conversation asking questions about the logic behind reasons given, and choose to learn rather than sit with past views. We are all at different points in our learning journey around topics, concepts, and ideas, but I don't think it is a linear process from ignorance to knowing. I think it is a non-linear process of meta-ignorance, with dynamic depths of understanding. But what do you think?